Hello, everyone, all in the interweb world. My name is Dave, and this is my co-host here, Laura Ranola. And Hello. We are here to talk about identity, and this is Matuti Talks. Leia Matutina, thank you so much for having us today. We, um, we've been asked to talk about identity, something that both myself and Laura are passionate about. And um, yeah, Laura, tell us about yourself. Who is your daddy and what does he do? <laughs> um, I guess when I think about identity, you know, in the Western world, a lot of us, we can, it's something that we identify with, you know, and I think a lot of us, depending on what influences or what we've been taught growing up, will kind of um, create the foundation of what we base our identity on. So I guess there are different types of identity, we might say, you know, whether it's based on some people might base it on titles or performance, educational backgrounds, pay, whatever it might be. Or like if you're a sports star, movie star, you know, but as we kind of like see the lives of many people, we tend to realize that, you know, identity is always being shaped or like changed or, you know, it's always been stretched that you cannot always just identify with something that doesn't last long. Um, and a, a good example of that is like, for example, if you have an Olympian, you know, all their life, they've been training to be an athlete. And then the moment they have their chance to perform, a lot of them go into an identity crisis after because it's like, what do I do next? You know, and they lose their entire sense of self. So I guess that poses the question of what is really identity? Um, any thoughts on that, Dave? Yeah, yeah, you definitely. Um hit a strong point there that we attach ourselves to what we do. Now, when you when you walk into a room full of strangers, um, the way that we as humans interact with one another is by putting a label on ourselves. Hi, my name is Dave. I bake cheesecakes, right? Or you get, if, if you're in an academic um, scene, you say what course you're doing and uh, those are your aspirations. Um, and so it's natural that we do that, but the thing about identity is that at its core, what's true about you is what makes you who you are. And it has to be true about you in every situation. For example, my name is Dave. I am the son of Ghani and Gladys. And that's true for me in every arena. However, you know, if I were to take my credentials as a pastor, you know, for those of you who don't know, I... I'm a full-time minister here in the Mount Drew area. And, you know, that's not something that's, you know, core to who I am. It's something that I do. And mm -hmm. I might mention that at a convention of other pastors, but I wouldn't mention that at a coffee shop, having a coffee with a stranger, right? Mm -hmm. It's what's core to you means that it's true in every situation that you're in mm -hmm. and titles and labels and what you do. You know, that's not core to who you are. That's an expression of who you are. And that mm -hmm. even changes through, throughout the whole course of your life. Um, I remember when I was in second grade, um, I had this drawing competition with my best friend named Eric. And this is in Long Beach, California. And I remember we had this competition. Who can draw the best? Because in our class, we were the two best drawers. And for some reason, I started copying what he was drawing, a car which had, which had a bunch of rockets on it. Mm -hmm. And... Everyone saw that I was copying, and for whatever reason, you know, I panicked, and that's what I drew. And they, of course, deemed him the better original artist. And in that moment, you know, year two, if I don't draw, then who am I, right? Mm, and yeah. and when, when we hit those failures, the things that we attach to our identity can collapse and fall apart, and we get we go into the spiral of a uh, mm. doubt of who who am I really, and that's why what we do is not the best indicator of who we are. Yeah. And the thing about that is that we're so influenced by society to tell us who we should be and what we should do. And a lot of those things that we tend to attach ourselves to, 
they don't last long, you know, and you go through all these phases of being lost because like you said, identity is the core of who you are. So in saying that, it's like identity is the things that we value. You know, the things that we value become our very, like what we identify with. And I think the idea of knowing your character, you know, that is something that can withstand different seasons, jobs, titles, you know, it says more about your character. So instead of looking at what I should do, what I should be, it's who, the question is who, like who is it that I am? And, you know, a lot of the time when we use our identity, it's more so like the who is is something that doesn't disappear. Does that make sense? What I'm trying to say, like the things we attach our identity to are all external factors, whereas identity is internal. Like you said, it's from the core. So I think a lot of the time when we place our values or our cores on the external things, we go through so many lows. You know, we go through so many seasons of searching and finding when in reality it was within. It was, you know, in who, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. And the, the other thing that I want to talk about is what, you know, to know who we are, um, we have to know what we're not. And the second thing beyond our title or our work or vocation, we are not what we desire, our wants. Mm-hmm. You know, um, every, this, this world, you know, society shows us, and we're part of the problem, okay? We mm-hmm. are part of the problem that we think that what we buy is who we are. Mm. When I look at a guitar, I'm, I love playing guitar. You know, there are a few brands that I stick my talent or my name on, right? I have a Gibson guitar. I got a Loudon guitar. One's made in the U.S. The other one is made in Ireland. And um, yeah, because of where it's made and the luthiers behind it and the craftsmanship, I feel like my value is increasing because I've attached myself to something that was made. Mm. But you know, the truth of those products is that you set a match to it and it's gone. And so is my sense of worth and value. And, and that's why we can't attach our identity to what we own or what we buy. You know, we, you might have brand loyalties as well and think that's who I am, but it's not you. It's not you. Take it away. You know, you're, you're more than that. Mm. And I find that a lot of the clients that I see, you know, they do struggle with identity, their sense of self, because, you know, a lot of the time they're not given the opportunity to develop or make sense of their characters. And like you said, it it becomes what we desire. And those things, like, for example, if I don't have enough, does that mean I'm not worthy? Does that mean I'm not valuable? Or when I have a lot, does that make me valuable or known or, you know, worthwhile of a person? And as you can see, those things, they fluctuate. So when you think about your identity, think about things that will ground you, you know, that can withstand, that can be that rock, that when you do lose a lot, that you still have that sense of identity, that sense of, you know, who you are at your core. And the thing about that is when we come to accept the fact that identity is ever changing, it's ever growing and accepting that it is a constant journey of just becoming, you know, a lot of writers like, um, who was it? Michelle Obama. Yeah. She wrote about her journey of becoming, and yet she's still becoming, you know, um, a lot of the time we kind of pin pigeonhole ourselves to one person, but the craziest thing is that we're just always going to be changing. And that's the thing about identity. It's like, we just grow and change all the time. The last thing I wanted to um, point out that what identity is not is um, our desires, our sexuality, um, the things we aspire to become. Um, those are part of who we are. Um, and sexuality, sexuality is a big thing, especially in today's world, because the danger of pinning our biggest identity in our sexuality is that that's just one aspect of who we are, mm. right? Um, my attraction to whether it's male or female or multiple whatever it is that's one aspect of what it means to be human all right Mm. and we can't say this is who i am and then 
And then that is what rules every other part of our life. Mm -hmm. um, we are sexual beings, but that's not the main thing that guides us in our day-to-day -day functions. I mean, mm -hmm. on, a, on a biological level, yeah, we, we do have those, those functions and those desires, but that's not all we are. And if we subject ourselves just to our sexuality, it's mm -hmm. like we're just going by instinct and by what the animal kingdom mm -hmm. dictates we ought to, to do for, you know, for our species. And that's not who we are. It's, it's one of the things of what it means to be human. And it's a beautiful thing mm -hmm. you know, for, for anyone who, who tries to belittle sexuality. You know, that's a big red flag there. It's like, hold on. If you belittle that, then you're saying one part of being human is evil. Not the mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. However, what we desire, what we aspire to be, those are, those are part of our identity. It's part of one of the dimensions of, of the beautiful um, makeup of what it means to be human. And, um, mm. and, but we can't base our identity solely on that. Mm. It is quite multifaceted, if that's yeah. what yeah. I must say. Yeah. It's, it's quite complex, you know, and I think that's the beauty of identity. It's curious like curiosity it's it it's something that's a mystery that people can't even pinpoint you know and I think it's what we make sense of it and that will kind of direct and guide you to what's important to you and I think we're just on this constant search and all those things that we mentioned that are not identity those are the things that are the least satisfying you know we constantly try and fill ourselves with those things to identify with, but we're just, it always leaves us thinking, what's next? You know, like I, I still lose myself. It doesn't make sense. Um, so it's trying to, I think a lot of us try and make sense of something that's so complex that needs a long longevity to it, like a process to it. Um, but that's where I'm coming from. Now that I've said that we are not, um, what we do, we are not what we have, and we are not what we desire. Um, what we are is love. Mm -hmm. Now that might that might feel like a cop out, and like oh, it's all about love, feel all mushy and warm and fuzzy. But mm -hmm. at the core of how the universe, as as a person of faith, I believe the universe was designed with love at the core. Mm -hmm. There's this, there's a theologian by the name of Henry Now, and he says. From the moment we claim the truth of being the beloved, we are faced with the call to become who we are. Nice. So until you know that love is the point, love is the core, love is the ocean that we're swimming in, you're mm. never going to find your full, most truest self. At mm. the core of who you are, your core identity, which is true in every situation that you're in, is that you are loved. Mm. Now, everything bombards us with you're not enough you're ugly you're mm -hmm. poor you, you you have lame jokes you know you're not good enough and people don't like you and that's where we diminish into something less than human mm -hmm. but at the core of how I, I i've experienced the universe is you know, as a person of faith i do believe in god and i believe that he created this world with love as the mm -hmm. goal and we're right in the middle of that. And once we understand, hey, I'm loved, then I can reach my full potential. Mm. So the craziest thing is like, you know, when people go through things of symptoms of depression and anxiety, it is because we are disconnected from the very things that, you know, bring us value, that bring us worth, that bring us, you know, the important things. And I feel like love 100% plays a huge role in, in our identity and who we're meant to be. And like I said earlier, it has a lot about character. You know, it, if our character isn't, you know, connected to like those characteristic traits of generosity, giving and all those things, you know, we do find less purpose in who we are. Um, does that make sense? I don't know if I'm making sense. But that's where I'm going. Like, I just want to say that when we are disconnected to things of love, you know, it's always like darkness or lost or um, a, a very lonely place, very isolated place. And a lot of us tend to find 
And, you know, I'm actually reading this really great book at the moment, and it's by a Christian called Ali Beth Stuckey, and she explores the toxic culture of self-love. And, you know, a lot of the time it's like we are challenged with the idea of we're not enough. But, you know, we always find ourselves when we're self-reliant on us, you know, thinking that we are enough, we're enough to do our roles, we're enough to do X, Y, and Z. But the amount of times we find ourselves reliant on, on just ourselves, it always becomes like a, we always end up in a dead end or we always end up in places where we're feeling that same unsatisfying feeling, you know, and that, that just goes to show that we cannot be self-reliant, you know, that there's something greater out there that we need. And as a woman of faith, you know, like, it, it's like, we have to become reliant. I know that I am not enough, but my God is enough. Yeah. You know, if I believe, if I put my own reliance on myself, I know as a human of how, you know, how many, how many times I fluctuate, how many times I feel burnt out, tired, or lost, or confused. I cannot be self-reliant on that to reach my full potential. I need an external, like something greater than myself to bring me to that full potential. Yeah, yeah. There's this um, phrase in, in the Latin language called imago Dei, which means the image of God. Now, mm. for, for those of you who aren't religious, um, you know, let me borrow your ear for a sec. This is, it's this grand um, idea that human beings, you and I, you know, made of flesh and blood, you know, composition mostly of water, and we have enzymes and proteins that make up our body, um, that we somehow are made in um, the likeness or the image of something greater than us, a creator. Um, you might not believe in, the, in God or a creator, but mm. then just imagine with me for a second that our meaning, our sense of purpose can come from something external. Mm. And I have to ask that question because everything in the, in the postmodern Western mind assumes that I am the center of the universe, mm. that my experience and that everything that I feel is the lens through which I define myself. Mm. Right. It's, and that's, that's a big, that's a big, that's a very, uh, that's a huge statement to make mm. for, for us, you know, we, we, we swim in the culture of the Western world where, the priority that we um, define and interpret truth is my experience and psychology and then um, science and the mm. arts and then um, traditions. And then if, if you believe in any Holy scripture, then it would be that, that text, that Bible or the Torah for you or any Buddhist writings. Maybe that's what you believe in, mm. but when we are at the center of our universe, if we don't have it right and things fall apart, then our whole world falls apart. Mm. Now, this idea of the image of God is taken from Genesis chapter one, where it says, so God created mankind, humanity, in his mm. own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So it's this idea that as males and females together, we reflect this greater being. Mm -hmm. and that, that's kind of crazy to think because uh, we're divine. We, we, we reflect, we, we look like God. God looks like us. That, that's a, that blows my mind because what that means is that the worth of a human being isn't defined by what I think they're worth. You know, you, you walk up to somebody and maybe they can, they can um, make me a coffee. That's a value to me. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they can, say something positive to me that's their value to me or maybe they're related to you and you know they your parents they have great value to you because they brought you mm -hmm. into the world however according to the jewish scriptures which became the christian scriptures there's this being above creation who created it all and because it was made in his image the human being has infinite worth Mm. And, and that, that's crazy to me. And that throughout history, um, the way that the human being has been defined is based on people's worldview of God. Mm -hmm. 
if God doesn't exist, then humans have whatever mm -hmm. worth I deem that they are. If they're a slave, that's all they are to me. If they're a, a wife or you know a baby maker, that's all they are to me. They're like cattle. They're, if they're kids, they, they have no worth in society until they can make money for me, right? That's how mm -hmm. all of history has viewed humanity, individuals. And it wasn't until this idea of the image of God came into being that human rights became a thing. You know, people who fought for equal rights with, for women, who fought for e equal rights for, for people of color, they got their big ideas and their motivation out of scripture. Mm. Prior to scripture, kings and queens can do whatever they want, treat people like property. But it wasn't until people understood I'm made in the image of God. I'm loved. I have value even when nobody else sees my value. And that flipped the world upside down. Mm. That, that made the early church. I mean, I, once again, I'm, I'm leaning into um, my faith and, and the history of my religion. The early church put value on orphans. They put mm. value on widows. When, mm. when the empire, the Roman empire saw that they were useless and they, they, their write-offs and no one had to care about them. It was the Christians, the people who followed Jesus, who saw mm. the infinite value and worth of these individuals and mm. said, we'll take them in. We'll take care of them. You know, it was mm. through Christians that the first hospitals were made. And, and that's where people came in and mm. they received care. And, and I love that big idea, the image of God. Mm. Uh, and I think you bring an interesting point in terms of that perception, you know, and that's why we cannot solely be reliant on ourselves because we are basing everything on what we've experienced and what we see. And if you think about how limited, um, you know, our perception is sometimes or our perspective, you know, like we really, our identity becomes small. Like we be, we become like, you know, we've just given ourselves a title, but identity is more than that. And like you said, like it, it, it's something greater and we cannot be self-reliant on ourselves naming who we are because we can't even pinpoint that, which is fascinating. So I think ideally identity is a journey. It's a journey of discovery. It's a journey of meaning and wholesomeness. Um, like it's way bigger than what I can even say, because even I can say from my personal experience that I'm still learning, unlearning, learning, unlearning, and it, it's at a constant. But as a woman of faith, when I set my identity on something that is solid, which is God, never changing the same as today and yesterday, you know, even though I may fluctuate, the world may fluctuate setting myself on something that is greater than me, that is grounding, that is solid, yes, gives like a sense of peace, knowing that it's okay for me to fluctuate. It's okay for me to actually not be enough because what I'm putting my faith or identity in is enough, more than enough, and bigger than what I could envision and imagine. You said something earlier about um, in your in your practice, because for those who don't know, Laura is a is a counselor here in Mount Druid, and she's doing a fantastic job. I, I know that, and I and you're so passionate about it, and mm -hmm. you see that at the core of all the the mental illness out there, and even physical, sense of physical is disconnection. Mm -hmm. The more isolated we are, the more disconnected we are, the more we lose our identity. Mm. And, and I love the context of scripture once again, is that we are part of a bigger story. I am part of a community. Mm. Like the, the story that God's telling is that he, he made all things beautiful and he calls mm. it good. And um, even the way he, uh, he, he says that you know, he created man and then he said that he was alone and that was not good. And mm. that, that says a lot about our identity, that we are not designed, we are not meant to go solo that exactly. our story 
our full potential is found in the context of community. Mm. Like we, we, can't, we can't do great things solo. Um, mm. And, and I, I love that dynamic because mm. it means I need Laura in my life. I need mm. Leia in my life. Mm. I need little Harvey and Bella to mm. be my full self. And that's a mm. story God's telling that, that if one of us were missing from that story, mm. it would be a lesser story and we'd feel empty. I'd feel that, that void in my life and I would not feel whole. And I, I need that community to know who I truly am. And that's the thing about self-affirmation, self-love. It's about the desires of self, you know? And once again, that becomes unsatisfying because you're only serving yourself. You're only loving yourself. And there's only so much that you can do with oneself. Um, and when you're attached to something greater, you know, you can definitely reach your full potential because you fit in the bigger picture. You know, you belong in the bigger picture. And that's how I feel, like you said, is how we reach our full potential is when we work together as a cohort. You know, like a lot of the time in a lot of teams that I've worked in, um, when someone is just focused on self, the whole team suffers. You know, like it's not benefiting, benefiting anybody. And the idea of like, you know, what makes a strong core or what, what makes you strong is being a part of something bigger and greater than yourself. And I think that's why people, you know, may struggle because they're too reliant or maybe too focused on themselves. You know, like, who am I? Me, 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 me. And then they become lost and even further more disconnected when the answers are in front of you or in the community around you. Um, but yeah, those are a few thoughts. Cool, cool. Well, we're winding down our time. And um, mm. do you want to close up with a couple of closing thoughts or some tips on how people can get a grip of, of their identity and you know, to, mm. yeah, to know themselves more? Mm. I think something that we tend to do with our counseling clients is starting off with values. You know, that's the first place where you can start. What is important to me? Um, what, where do I feel the most like importance, you know, whether it might be family, whether it might be growth, whether it might be, you know, anything that you like, it, but it can't be external. That's the thing. These values are core you know, things that have meaning and have weight. Um, so start there. I think that's what kind of starts you on your journey. Beautiful. Uh, going back to that idea of the image of God, you know, I'm, I'm not saying, and I don't think Schiffer says that people of faith have the monopoly on identity mm-hmm. or creativity. Um, according to scriptures, when, when humanity messed up, Adam and Eve, you know, they ate the fruit. Um, a lot was lost, but not everything was lost. Mm-hmm. And that core identity is still there. Whether mm-hmm. or not someone believes in God, there's still value. Mm-hmm. You are still love. You mm-hmm. still, your identity is still intact. Mm-hmm. And because you're human, man, you have great potential, right? Uh, and, for, and when I look at people who aren't of faith and they're creating beautiful things, that's where it's at. That's mm. beautiful. And I guess the most practical thing I'd say is just get connected. Find someone who, who affirms the goodness in you. Find mm. someone who believes in you, even though, even though they've seen all your mistakes. Those are the people that affirm that you are loved, you are accepted, you mm. are valued, uh, no matter what the world says. Because mm. you are not what you do. You are not the, the stuff that you have and you are not um, just merely your desires or your base yeah. instincts. You're so yeah. much more than that. Yeah. Cool. Well, right. thanks everyone for listening. I hope you got something out of it. I wanted to say more, but we're strapped for time. <laughs> thanks well, for thanks. listening. Thanks, Leah, for having us on the 2 Talks. Yeah, good times. Take care, family. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Instagram. Thanks for watching.